and thank you for joining us for our second episode of Sultana Sessions. My name is John Mann. I'm the director of the Lawrence Wetlands Preserve, and our topic tonight is diversity in the outdoors. This is a discussion that, like a lot of organizations, we've been having internally, uh, and we've uh, stepped up those efforts certainly in the past year. Um, but we thought it was an important opportunity to have this discussion publicly. And so I'm gonna have uh, two guests that I'm gonna bring on in just a minute who were um, gracious enough to join me to help us talk about this. But before they come on, I just wanted to kind of categorize how we're gonna aim to tackle this. Because when you say diversity in the outdoors, that's a huge topic. What does it mean? How do we plan to talk about it in 30 or 45 minutes? Well, we're certainly not gonna cover every aspect of it, but to me, when I think of diversity, I think of representation. And so for me, uh, I would feel like I'm running diverse programs if our program participants are representative of the community we serve. And so for us at Sultana, that would be the Eastern Shore mostly at large. Um, so that's enough of, of a preamble. Uh, let me go ahead and bring on my guests. Um, so we have Doncella Wilson and Clarence Gilmer. Uh, Doncella is a councilwoman in Denton, Maryland and a native to the Eastern Shore. She is the co-founder of Maneri's Dream Alliance Incorporated, which is located right here in Kent County, Maryland. Uh, Doncella wears a lot of hats, um, but I'm interested in that one in particular because uh, we'll get into it tonight, but that's, that's an organization here in Kent County that has some good opportunities to help encourage diversity in outdoor pursuits. Uh, and then Clarence Gilmer uh, is a friend of mine that I first knew uh, as an outdoor educator at Echo Hill Outdoor School, which is also right here in Kent County. Um, Clarence is a, um, a survivalist. He's a, um, he specializes in teaching people about primitive skills. Okay, so uh, bushcraft, skills that you might have think of as native people um, as practicing. Um, and he probably most publicly put those skills to the test three times as he appeared as a contestant on the Discovery Channel's Naked and Afraid, a television show which drops uh, strangers off in the middle of nowhere um, with basically no tools and no clothing, and they have to try to survive. Uh, and so maybe we'll get into some of that tonight as well. Um, so to my two guests, welcome. Good night. Okay, thank you, John, for that introduction. Uh, oh, you're very welcome. So let's just get into it. Um, first of all, assuming that our audience doesn't already know the two of you, um, Let's start with who you are and how you developed your relationship to the outdoors. So um, maybe if you want to talk about where you grew up or as a child, did you spend much time in the outdoors? Um, and if not, or if you did, how did that impact who you would become as an adult? Um, so let's go with the ladies first policy. We'll start with Don Sella. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So yes, for growing up, I grew up right here on Maryland's beautiful Eastern Shore, uh, mainly in Queen Anne's County and in an area in, called in Barkley, Maryland. And so this area is also called um, Big Woods for the local people around this area. Um, anyone, if you know someone with the last name Seals, then they originated from this area in Barkley. So a lot of memories of growing up and being in the outdoors. There was an area that myself and my cousins would frequent um, called the Big Ditch. So all of these um, Eastern Shore names and little teeny locations. But we would do everything in the outdoors and in the woods as far as looking to hunt and making our own hunting materials and things like that from hiking um, through the woods. And I was always following behind my older cousins and my older male cousins and wanting to be in the outdoors and things like that. So a lot of fond memories of being in and in, um, in the outdoors. Great, thank you. Uh, so Clarence, same question to you. Um, where did you grow up? What were your outdoor experiences as a child and how did that impact who you are as an adult in relations to the outdoors? 
Um, well, I was born in Annapolis, Maryland, but I went to high school and college in Baltimore, Maryland. And I was an indoor city kid. I played Nintendo, stayed on the computer, and I wouldn't leave at all. I actually taught business management at Test College of Technology in uh, Towson, um, Towson, Maryland. Uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit, I saw a lot of urban people in, in cities without the skills to get their own water, to build their own shelters, to survive. So I started reading books about survivalism. I started camping and backpacking right after Hurricane Katrina. Started to learn as many skills as I possibly could. Um, while on a backpacking trip, I found out about a job with outdoor education. And since I had some teaching experience and very little backpacking experience, they hired me along. That was in 2006. And every year, except for uh, 2020 COVID year, I uh, was working in outdoor education every single year, all across the country, all over the world. I was able to teach uh, in West Africa. I was able to teach in St. Croix, Montana, um, Portland, Oregon, all across the country. And um, to show that, you know, people that look like me can be survivalists as well, I wanted to show my skills on the show, Naked and Afraid, showing that we can make fires and shelters and clean water just like everyone else. So it was a good opportunity to share our skills. Great, thanks so much. So before, I might've gotten a little ahead of myself because before we dig too deeply into this topic, some people might be wondering, well, how do we even know this is an issue, right? Uh, you can talk anecdotally, but can you prove it? Um, and so I did a little uh, research and um, I just found something that jumped out at me from the, uh, U.S. Forest Service, where um, they, they did a study and they showed that people of color make up 40% of the United States population. So you would expect if we're getting equal representation that visitors to national parks should be 40% people of color. Um, but instead they found that 70% of park visitors are white people. So that's pretty glaring right there that there's, there's a discrepancy. Um, and um, Black people in particular remain the most dramatically underrepresented group in these spaces. So then I think the natural question is why, right? Um, when I think of this, um, some ideas that jump out at me and maybe you guys can add to this list or, or expand upon some of these ideas is questions. Is it, is it a lack of awareness, right? Do, they, do people not know where these opportunities are around them? Is it a lack of access. Um, if I live uh, in an area that doesn't have a lot of natural spaces, um, is it a, a sense of hostility, right? When I visit there, do I not feel welcome from other people? Um, or is it a discomfort? Do, do I just feel nervous because uh, some people have, you know, a natural fear of the woods, no matter what color they are? Um, those are just some of the initial things that jumped out at me. Does that, do those ideas strike you as ones that may ring true? Are there some ideas you would add to um, as far as what, what would be the, some of the biggest reasons for that discrepancy uh, in getting representation in outdoor spaces? And we can, whoever wants to take a jump at that one, we can go in any order. Um, I, I, I'd like to say uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of history and I was always taught you don't know where you're going unless you know where you're coming from and in the past you know and still today people fear what they don't understand and that fear is very powerful it's one of the most powerful emotions that humans have and because in the past whites feared and didn't understand blacks they had segregated. They had segregated pools, segregated parks. You know, Disneyland was segregated at one point in time. And that system has become cultural. You know, you don't see a lot of black swimmers. You don't see a lot of black hikers because these areas were designed so that people can escape urban areas and escape diversity and get to a more natural environment. Um, not only that, but I also believe that there is profit and keeping people indoors. You make money if people stay home 
and order pizza and play video games and stay on the computer. You know, you don't make money if people are walking in a free park that the states pay for, whether it's a federal park or a national park. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an uphill battle to keep kids indoors and it's effective, it's working. Yeah, and John, I would just add to that I agree with a lot of the points that you meant that you mentioned, but it is that exposure is the access and then the education that growing up and as Clarence talked about the history, if you are not exposed to the outdoors, if you are not exposed to some of the places historically that were set up to keep us segregated and out, a lot of times when I think of the Eastern Shore and the water and being outdoors, I think a lot about the country clubs that are in our areas on the Eastern Shore. I think about the yacht clubs and what those opportunities afford certain groups and not a lot of times brown faces are not in those spaces. But when you have systems that are set up, such as um, our country club, yacht clubs, that those were all um, built during a time where brown and black people that we were fighting for the right to vote, <laughs> the right to be free, the right to an education. At the same time, some of those structures were erected. And so as Clarence talked about, it's been that segregation um, for us for such a long time and those systems are still in place. And do we feel welcome when we go into these structures? Do we feel welcome in the outdoors? And we talk about our national parks and how do we feel at our local parks? Because I can tell you um, many experiences where I take my niece and my grandson to a park when we get there, white families pack up and quickly exit. <laughs> so, and we just want to come and run and play and be outside and, and just be out in the outdoors um, and be able to experience all the things that you can when you're outdoors. So for me, it's all of those things. How will we be treated in the environment? Will anyone in this environment look like me when I get there? And so um, it just really goes back to, as Clarence said, to just that historical perspective of how we've been treated in these spaces. I think that's a great point, um, and, and that also kind of echoes on it's hard to be what you haven't seen, right? As, as human beings, we like to see an example of someone doing something before we recognize, okay, I can do that. Um, and you see that all the time in, in athletic pursuits. It's like once a world record is broken, then all of a sudden many other people tend to follow that also break that record. But until that first person does something, it's kind of uh, almost seen as impossible. Um, so Clarence, I, I want to toss this to you as, um, because I imagine in your career as an outdoor educator, um, there were lots of times when school groups would arrive. Um, and if I'm a young black boy and I get off the bus and I see Mr. Clarence there, that's probably going to mean something important to me. And so I'm wondering if you had experiences, um, where you felt that, did that put an extra weight on your shoulders? Was it something you wore as a badge of honor? How did that play out um, as you were teaching young boys um, and you might have been one of the few black faces that they saw amongst the uh, staff leading them? I, I know that the very first time I ever camped outside alone under the sun, uh, under the stars, was when I was 26 years old. I didn't know outdoor education existed until I was in my mid-20s. Um, so when I see cities, you know, students coming from the Bronx or students coming from Baltimore, and I see a lot of them are people of color, uh, I get excited to show how well I'm connected. Oh, you know, I'm just like them. I'm from the same areas that they're from. I've been to the same areas as them, and I feel comfortable here. It's easier to acclimate when you feel comfortable. You, you can step out of your comfort zone a little bit but you wanna feel safe when you're in a new environment. But I always felt more excited when I was talking to the white students that weren't from areas that had students that looked like me or didn't have friends that looked like me. I, I felt it was more important for me to show them. And the same thing when I'm hiking, I have a big belt buckle with a buffalo on it I got from Montana, giant belt buckle. Um, I have a camouflage shirt that I try to blend in like you know when I'm in West Virginia and hiking. Um, so connecting with those guys, I feel, is just as important, if not more important, than connecting with people that look like me. They see me, they feel comfortable, I can tell jokes. But when I see the, the farm kid who grew up hunting, who doesn't have any Black friends, there are no Black students at the school, and I'm his favorite instructor, not only am I making him feel comfortable out there, but I'm also helping him, you know, break barriers and, and, and uh, you know, see different cultures and such, so... 
I've been fortunate enough to be able to work with from ages four to 84. Uh, from every, you know, I've worked with millionaires, I've worked with senator sons, I've worked with famous singers, uh, children, I'm not going to mention their names. <laughs> but yeah, famous kids, but I've also worked with really poor kids. I worked with kids, you know, that I had one student, his house caught a fire and he had this one jersey. It was the only thing he could keep from the fire. He was in a homeless shelter for two years before he came to work with my program. And sitting with him and explaining to him, like, yeah, I've got family that's been in homeless shelters. You know, I understand what life's like. I understand how important that shirt is. You know, let's enjoy nature. Let's, you know, put up a, a, a little tarp tent, you know, and, and camp out and have and feel comfortable and have fun. You know, the poorest of the poor. I mean, everyone should be have positive experience and everyone should have some kind of connection. So I try to connect with every type of student. But when I'm the, when I'm the only black person in, the, in the staff, I get extra attention. Um, I've had white kids ask me, do you know how to rap? That's the first question they ask me. And I always respond, of course, <laughs> but you can rap too, let's rap together. But I've also seen, you know, black kids ask, what are you doing out here? This is dirty, this is gross, this is scary. You know, and I'm like, you're safer here than you are in streets in Baltimore. You're safer here in the woods with no sleeping bag, no tent in the grass than you are in Brooklyn, you know, laying on the street. So, you know, everyone right. should feel comfortable. You know, that, that idea of common ground reminds me of, uh, so on Tuesday night to the audience, the three of us got together and kind of talked about what we were going to talk about uh, tonight. And um, something that Clarence said uh, then that really stuck with me was, we're all descendants of survivalists, right? All all of our ancestors lived another day, and if they hadn't, we wouldn't be here. So th that's definitely going to be um, a line I'm going to use um, next time I'm working with students, just to like, even if they're like, oh, I don't, I don't do nature. Well, guess what? Your great, great, great grandfather did, and your great, great, great grandmother did. And uh, so that's somewhere within you. We just have to figure out how to tap into it uh, and let it out. Um, Don Sello, let's get into Maneri's Dream Alliance a little bit. Um, if, let's assume that there's some people in our audience who don't know what I'm talking about. Um, it's kind of a, a new entity in Kent County, but it's really exciting. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So Maneri's Dream Alliance Incorporated is a new nonprofit that was founded by myself and co-founder um, Paul Tu. And the whole premise behind with even the name of Maneri's Dream Alliance speaks to the outdoors and the waterways here on the eastern shore. The name Maneri's is actually a combination name of my great grandmother, Minnie, and my grandmother, Mary. So when you combine those names, you have Maneri's. And then the full name of the organization, the dream is just what we are doing now, being able to reach communities, providing resources in the areas. And that alliance piece is that we want to be an umbrella for other grassroots organizations that may not have the time, the funds to be able to set up a structure as a nonprofit and where we can be a sponsor organization. Um, we're talking about family, talking about the outdoors. Uh, my great grandmother grew up in an area in Queen Anne's County. And within that area, it's the Kent Narrows area. So most people know that area uh, where the jetty and the Hilton and things like that. So when we go back and talk about where our ancestors are from, that complete work that they did there on the waterways and seafood processing facilities, however, living in one room shanties, one room shacks, and they were not able to profit off of a very profitable market. So that is the history, the homage that I want to be able to carry forward um, for other youth and communities. But our main focus um, right now, and um, just one correction, John, that the nonprofit is an Eastern Shorewide nonprofit. We have been fortunate enough in Kent County to be able to lease a space in Kent County, the American Legion. It currently houses our Senior Feed the Elderly Initiative. And then we also have been awarded a new Adolescent Clubhouse grant to be able to work with youth ages 12 to 17. And that will look like working with youth to deter from substance abuse, to deter and address trauma and needs. And we filled in a lot of excellent ideas, educational um, pieces within this grant. And one of the pieces I'm excited about is the environmental education piece. We've been talking to Shore Rivers. We've had co many conversations about what we can do with the land. We've also had members of the Sultana reach out to see what we can do to make both of these spaces more inclusive and how we can work together. So we are looking to launch that adolescent clubhouse model 
April 1st. So if you have a youth that's between the ages of 12 to 17, you will be able to go to our website, which is um, MenariesDreamAlliance.org. And on that website, you will be able to make a referral and to sign up to be a part of that program. And it's looking for you 12 to 17, but we want to be able to provide services for the whole family. And with the space there at the American Legion, it's nine acres of land. It also backs to the water. So we want to be able to do things like harvesting mussels, fishing, growing produce and plants um, to be able to develop a healing garden. You can also camp on site. So Clarence should be able to bring um, some groups down to the site and camp, um, which camping is something I love to do um, growing up being a Girl Scout and all of that. So I've camped to hear Clarence say he didn't camp till he was 26 is interesting because I've always camped. But um, so that's a bit about um, Maneri's Dream Alliance. And as I said, you can follow us on on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and check our website out for more exciting and interesting things that are going on there. Thanks so much. Um, so let's get into it. Let's assume we're getting students, uh, maybe their parents, out to places like Maneri's Dream Alliance uh, coming out with Salt Tent, right? If they're getting these outdoor experiences, what, what do you think participants are going to gain from that? Um, and then the other end of that is what do the outdoors gain from having new people come out um, and, and build a connection to those places? Yes, yeah, so I'll start with. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so the environment gains um, new people out in the environment to learn about the different plants that are there, to learn about the different species that are there in the um, river that is in the back of that facility, and also to gather a um, just a real sense of appreciation for the environment that a lot of times we're out with playing sports, we're on the grounds and we're not really um, appreciating the things that the environment can and the outdoors can provide for families. And so for us, we just wanna make sure that we are providing those opportunities for the whole family to come on site and to experience and engage as we talked about that exposure, the access education. And we want families to be able to come out and experience the outdoors um, with everyone. We want a place, as I said, for the youth to come, for mom to come, and grandmom to be able to come. Uh, Clarence, before, I know you got some good stuff to add to that, but maybe you could explain to our audience uh, where you are and why is it getting dark behind you? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, uh, I am currently in West Virginia in the mountains, and uh, I'm starting a homestead. We've got power hooked up, uh, but we have you know so so water and no wi-fi connection whatsoever so in order for me to use my internet i have to go into town which is about a 15 20 minute drive um so i'm sitting in my truck right now in front of the police station because they have the most lights in the parking lot and uh yeah this is where i am this is this is this is this is, this is where i connect to the world when i go back to my house you know, I can, I can, I can maybe get an emergency nine one one in, but I have to go to the end of the driveway for that, which is a little uphill as well. So I'm definitely out in the middle of nowhere. This is how much you're willing. This is how much you're willing to give to the people that you're, you're just willing to uh, leave your nice warm house, get in your truck, and drive to a parking lot to talk to us. Uh, and we appreciate it. And I think it just drives home uh, how much of an outdoorsman you are, uh, because. Clarence is basically never outside. He lives in nature, basically. Right. I've got 53 acres, and I've got maybe 15 coyotes that live in the backyard. I set up a trail camera, and we have a half a dozen deer that, you know, frolic about as well. Um, I can shoot a gun in my backyard, and only two neighbors will be able to hear it. Uh, I, I basically live in the woods, and I got that appreciation from teaching and outdoor education. I got that appreciation for the deer and the coyotes and the mosquitoes and the dirt and the mud from positive experiences I've had in nature. Uh, so I, I agree with Don Seller when she says, you know, that appreciation what's most important. We're not going to save the environment if you don't care about the environment. You're not going to vote to preserve these parks if you've never been to a park. Um, so having that experience, having that firsthand experiential moment I think is extremely important. But I think it also addresses some uh, issues that we have, and especially in urban areas. We see it on native reservations. We see it throughout all different classes with issues with obesity, 
issues with, you know, attention deficit issues with, you know, depression issues. And I believe that all of, all of those happen when people are sitting in front of the computer. The only interaction with people is, is, you know, social media, you know, or video games, you know, and that's their, their network and they're just sitting and they're just eating and they're just playing. So, um, you know, it's exercise when you're outside, it's healthy, you know, it helps brain development, helps with test scores. You know, there's so much that you get from being outdoors. It's just good for your health. Absolutely. I mean, and this past year has really driven that home. And yeah. you've seen that uh, in, you know, outdoor sporting goods sales, right? Like you, you couldn't find a tent on Amazon. You couldn't find a kayak. Um, and we just, um, not, to, not to put a plug in here, but we opened up our summer camps uh, maybe a week ago and they're basically sold out. And we're, we're scrambling looking at, you know, are there ways we can expand capacity? So there's, there's always been that hunger for people to spend time outside. And um, I, I think really this past year, it's uh, reminded us how important it is. Um, and, and the reason I asked what, how would those outdoor spaces benefit? Um, and I'm glad you both drove that home is because some people can be possessive of the outdoors they can be exclusive right I, I like to go to my favorite trail and i want to be the only people there it's mine um and i understand that because it's nice to spend time you know peaceful time in nature you don't always want to crowd there but uh like clarence touched on just then if you're the only person that cares about it then you're the only person that's probably going to be willing to fight to protect it um so yeah r really we should all those of us who are environmental lovers should be focused on trying to light that spark in as many people as possible. Um, so then I'd like to kind of briefly touch on organizations like Sultana and other outdoor education organizations. Um, as we're attempting to diversify both in our staff um, and in our participants, um, I'm just wondering if you have ideas or strategies or um or just things that we might not be thinking of that you would point out um i always tell people with sultana we are very well represented during the school year because our primary clients are public schools um and so our eastern shore public schools are pretty representative of our eastern shore population so that's not an issue when we're taking groups out sailing or groups are coming to the Holt center um, we're getting every color of the rainbow that you have here on the Eastern shore. Um, but when it comes to, uh, signing up for summer programs or people applying to work here, um, we see less diversity. Um, and, and, and that's something that we've tried to strategize about. And again, I think a lot of it might echo on ideas we've already touched on. Uh, do I know you, right? If I'm, if I'm coming to your summer camp, um, well, not only do we have to reach the students, we have to reach the parents. Um, and so are they as connected to you as the students might be? So any thoughts on that idea? Uh, how do outdoor education organizations um, become more diverse in their staff and, uh, and getting more diverse clientele? I know that's a big question. Um, I, I'll take a shot at it. Uh, I think summertime is the key time. Summertime is when you don't have the school students and the students with, you know, fellow students that they've been with all the time. I had a very good friend of mine from Iowa who had a circle of friends in Massachusetts because that's where he went to summer camp. And these people at the summer camp were from all over the nation, all over the planet. Um, so the, the problem with that is to send your kid to another state it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of trust. So a lot of people, you know, I know that my parents wouldn't have trusted sending me in high school to Hawaii or Alaska or any place far away. Um, uh, but I do think it's also important to have the family involved as well. So having moments where the parents can come with the kids, where the whole family is coming together, then you're going to see, you know, the, the parents are learning just as, just as much. The parents are experiencing it just as much. I know when I was in West Africa, I had an issue trying to help uh, teach students about composting. When I told the parents about composting and they came in with it, 
they help the students understand and they learn a little bit themselves and they taught me how they do it. So, you know, the, you know, the same thing happened when I was in New York. I worked for, you know, YMCA organizations. I worked with the Sultana guys. Uh, I've worked with Boy Scouts. I worked with the Girl Scouts. Um, I've worked with the biggest outdoor education center in, on the West Coast and in New England, um, in Portland, Oregon area. And for all of them, they all had issues with diversity and funding. So how do you get money for kids to get to these places? And, you know, it should be mandatory. Every single student there is in the nation, all of them should have at least a week of summer camp, at least a week where your school comes and, and experiences that education. So, yeah, I think it's important uh, and healthy. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I always cringe when I hear, I, I mean, I'm not denying that summer slip doesn't exist. And I know academics are important, but there's also, you know, all those things that you talked about where children are learning other things in summertime, if they can be doing camping and roasting marshmallows and paddling a canoe. Um, and just that jogs my, when you say bring the whole family in, um, I, I want to put a plug that we have uh, two opportunities. So as the manager of the Lawrence Wetlands Preserve, if you don't know what that is, uh, it's an eight and a half acre property right here on the edge of Chestertown. Uh, if you've been on the rail trail, you probably walk right by it and not realize it. Um, but we're, we've been leading programs for parents, families, pod schools, small groups, because it's, it's a great socially distanced place. Uh, it has a one acre pond where uh, they can scoop nets and catch tadpoles and catch fish. Um, and uh, it's a really exciting project that we're just kind of scratching the surface of what we're going to be doing with groups back there. But if that, if you're watching this and that sounds like something you'd be interested in, shoot me an email. Hopefully my colleague, uh, Chris Serino is putting relevant information into the chat. Uh, and then also we, uh, we didn't do our traditional summer camps last year because of COVID, but we started doing family paddles where, you know, whatever your family group is, however you define that, those people could come out as a group and, and go canoeing, kayaking, uh, find a beach, swim around, fish with Brad Hirsch. And, and that was a huge success. And that's definitely something we're going to continue on, uh, even knock on wood once we're beyond this pandemic. Um, and a lot of those, you talk about funding, um, a lot of those, luckily, we have uh, sources that, outside sources that are helping to fund those programs. So uh, we don't ever want financial reasons to be a burden to keep people away from, from doing programs with us. Um, as we start to wrap up, um, I always, anytime you talk about an issue, I think it's helpful to leave with some optimism, right? If you're, if you're teaching someone about climate change and you only tell them about the problems, you're probably going to depress them and they'll never want to think about climate change again. Um, so the issue we're talking about is underrepresentation. Um, is it getting any better? Do you, do you see signs of hope uh, even in your lifetimes um, from when you were children to, to nowadays? Do you think children in 2021 have it easier, harder, the same? Um, and uh, obviously, we still have work to do based on those, some of those statistics and some of those stories we've been telling. But um, what, what do you guys think? Do, do you have reasons to be optimistic or am I uh, pie in the sky for even asking that question? So I'll go. And I did just want to add uh, one thing to, um, John, your previous question about um, areas and the Sultan and different programs remaining diverse and increasing diversity and things like that. And I just want to encourage all programs just to remain intentional about your outreach and that you are out in communities because a lot of times and what COVID has really shown is the lack of broadband Internet services that families had. So a lot of times we get accustomed to posting on Facebook and social media and thinking that message has went out and on our websites. But it's really about getting out into the communities and getting information to families, because we think we're doing a great job of advertising and marketing, but it's getting that information out, getting it out in Spanish, English, whichever languages that are um, the majority for your community, 
joining in with diverse organizations and diversity also meaning our populations that are disabled, um, that they are able to access into these services and their supports as well. And then also um, just adding that program, that uh, piece about program staff development and training and looking at um, training such as ACES for all your staff, which is adverse childhood experiences. So people are understanding your camp staff are understanding the students that are actually coming in um, to them and the things that they've had to leave behind in order to even get to camp. Um, we also talk about transportation on the Eastern Shore, which is an issue. So how is a young person um, going to get to your camp? It's eight to four and mom has to work seven to three thirty. So looking at um, just those things was just really being vigilant in the community and about that intentional piece and that intentional outreach. And then also, um, so I add while I'm here about the hope <laughs> piece, I don't think it's a pie in the sky um, to be hopeful. I think youth now have a lot more distractions for them as Clarence and I both said when I was growing up too, that I did not have cell phones and the, all the technology in the games and things like that, that were a distraction. I could get out into the environment. I am hopeful now that a lot of eyes are open on issues of diversity, structural, systematic, racism. And so we're all taking a look at it. You can talk to our youngest students, four or five, they are understanding what's going on now and where our nation has been, where it's heading, and that hopefully the history and things that we are driving home now, that we will have change in a few years to come. So I'm definitely optimistic. I'm hopeful. I'm going to continue to do my part in the community to maintain inclusive safe space, inclusive safe spaces for all family members and to join in with other organizations um, just so we can continue to build trust amongst the organizations. Because I think that's one of the pieces we haven't touched on is just that trust when we get to places and to these spaces and who is behind um, the scenes that are operating the programs and the organizations. Uh, I see on, uh, on Facebook, Kent, Kent County Cultural Alliance uh, gave you a thumbs up for those comments, Don So also I just wanted to <laughs> relay that. Okay, Go ahead, thank Claire. you. Um, I say, when it comes to hope, uh, ignorance is bliss, but knowledge is power. And the more that we know, the more hopeful we get. So just the fact that you're able to see statistics on how diverse national parks are means that there's information, people are, are keeping track, people are, there's, there gives hope. I doubt you'd be able to get those same statistics, especially not as easily 50 years ago. Um, so the fact that people are being aware that change needs to be needs to happen knowing there's a problem is the first way to fix a problem and there are a lot of problems in society and being in nature is one of the easy most natural solutions um and it's sustainable it's been there since long before we've been there so uh it's cheap it's sustainable it's healthy everyone should be outside so i'm hopeful um i've, I've seen people come up to me after seeing me on the tv show people of color saying man, so I saw you on there and you inspired me. Now I'm doing outdoor education. I said, hey, I was inspired by someone else. You need to go and inspire other people as well. Pass it forward. You know, everyone needs to spend time in nature. So I'm hopeful uh, because I am seeing more and more people have fun outside. So and that's all over the planet. You know, I'm seeing it in Brazil. I'm seeing it in Italy. I'm seeing it everywhere. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, I love it. Uh, um. I know that's probably a streetlight behind you, but I'm pretending it's the sun setting over the mountains. Doesn't it kind of look like that? That was I, John. I was like, that's the sun setting. And even though right, we know right. it's, it's the light from the police yeah. station. Right. I was, yeah. I was looking at my car and realizing it can't still be the sunlight. But um, to both of you, I just want to thank you so much for joining me um, and, and contributing so much of your time and your energy and your thoughts, not just talking as you are tonight, but I know this is like, this is something that you all work on every day in different aspects of your lives. Um, and like I mentioned at the outset, uh, this is a big topic. It's not, it's not something you neatly talk about in 30 or 40 minutes. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's something that we're talking about more. Um, I can tell you as an employee here, um, I'm feeling that push from our board. And I think that's good. That's powerful that they're, they're saying, you know, you need to do more. You need to show me statistics, right? What did your numbers look like last year? How are you improving them this year? Like Clarence said, if you don't 
uh, quantify those things, then you don't know whether things are getting better or worse. Um, so I would just say, you know, to anyone who's watching, um, hopefully this inspired you a bit. Maybe it made you um, think about things somewhat differently, but there's, there's plenty of work to be done. Um, and I know Chris has been dropping some links into the uh, chat. So if, if you want to follow up and ask questions, um, I know Don Sella would be happy to answer some of them. I'd be happy to answer some of them. If you can send a carrier pigeon to uh, the mountains of West Virginia, you can get in touch with Clarence. Um, and then this, this discussion will be archived on our YouTube page. So uh, if there's someone who you think should see it, uh, please send them that way. So Don Sella, Clarence, unless there's anything final you want to say, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. All right, you're welcome. Yeah, I would like to say one final thing, and that is get outdoors, get outside in the rain, get outside in the snow and the sun as much as you possibly can. It doesn't take a lot of money, it doesn't take a lot of time, even if it's your backyard playing in the mud, any chance you get to be under the sun, everyone should be outside, always. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to get some decent weather, at least on Sunday. So, uh, and there's no such thing as bad weather, right? Just bad gear. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, spotlight myself once more. Um, and uh, I just wanted to remind you that we're doing these Sultana sessions um, every other Thursday. So our next session is going to be April 1st. Um, and it's going to be hosted by myself, um, although I had a beard in this picture. Uh, and the topic is Topic is going to be Bay Science 101. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of devising this to be like a primer, all those things that maybe your kids know and you're not sure if you know. Uh, I'm gonna try to uh, go through just some, some good basic stuff. So when you're hearing environmental news about the Bay, um, hopefully it clicks on a different level. And I'm even gonna try to uh, show you a few fun experiments um, that you could try at home that might illustrate some of these things for other adults or other students. So thank you so much for joining us and I'm gonna sign off and hope that you have a good evening.